Hello, my name is Jeff Wright, Chief Technologist with the Oracle Storage Organization. I'm here to talk to you today about the ZFS Storage Appliance Analytics feature. The ZFS Storage Appliance Analytics feature is comprehensive instrumentation that covers all the major hardware and software components of the ZFS storage system. It tells us who is accessing what resources in the system, the quality of service delivered for, to the users accessing those resources, and the consumption of the individual components in the system. Using this information, we can quickly diagnose bottlenecks, take care of quality of service escalation related problems, and identify where bottlenecks are occurring in the system so we can proactively or reactively upgrade or change the system to meet newer increased service requirements. Initial login to the ZFS storage appliance shows a status page. Here we see a general overview broken down in the last hour, the last day, and the last week of activity. We covered the CPU, the network and disk has major physical components in the system, and the workload incident on those components through the NFS v3 and v4 protocols, SMB protocols, FTP, and iSCSI. This quick dashboard gives us an overview of the work incident on the system and the consumption of the different components in the system. More detailed information can be found on analytics by going to the analytics section of the worksheet and selecting the statistics to look at on the system. The statistics are comprehensive. From a CPU consumption standpoint, we can see CPUs broken down by utilization, including the utilization in different CPU modes. So we can tell how the software in the ZFS storage appliance is running and which parts of that specific software are being used to support user workloads. Similarly, on the ARC axis, our primary cache, we can see the cache axis broken down hit and miss, file name, L2 ARC eligibility, which tells us if a particular miss is something that would have been populated in the L2 arc, a good indicator of you need a read flash. We can see this broken down by project, share, and LUNs from a block access standpoint. Other important bits, the arc size, how big is the cache, you can tell when the cache is warming up and when it's stable. Other interesting bits, the L2 arc access, so just like the primary cache, the secondary cache we have on read optimized flash, we can also observe access by hit miss, file name, project shares, lines, and so on. L2 arc size, similarly to the arc size in the system, we can observe how big it is and when it's appropriate to add more components. For secondary processing data movements, such as NDMP, we can watch bytes to transfer to and from disk, bytes transferred to and from DAPE, file system operations, number of jobs that are running and types, as well as shadow migration, which files, which projects, which shares, and so on. We cover this in bytes, number of operations, and finally requests. Physical component standpoint, disk, we can watch the number of IO operations. This is the active queue if you're used to IO stat. We can see the disk broken down by percent utilization individually. Watch the number of IO bytes by disk and by type in aggregate. Similarly, IO operations, and with those operations, we can see the offset as well as the response time or latency. This is really handy when you're trying to troubleshoot problems related to randomly accessing data versus sequentially accessing data and in cases where sometimes the application behavior is inconsistent with what we think it's going to do. We can look at the disk broken down by percent utilization. Similar to the disk, we can look at ZFS in terms of how many logical I.O. bytes he's running compared to how many bytes are actually going to disk a good measure when you're looking at the inflation from RAID and mirroring calculations. Memory standpoint, we can observe most aspects of the memory, including specific usage of applications running on the appliance so that we understand which parts of the memory are being consumed. We also can look from a network perspective, data access in terms of bytes transferred on the data links, at the interfaces, physical interfaces, the interface bytes, this is the IP addresses assigned to those interfaces. Finally, we can track IP bytes by host protocol direction, IP packets. Similarly, in the TCP stack, we can look at the client as well as service and direction, and similarly with TCP packets. From a front end protocol standpoint, or the application protocol standpoint, we instrument the fiber channel or block protocol from a perspective of the initiators, targets, and LUNs. Similar to the bytes transferred, we look at the operations. We see here the operations are also broken down by latency, so that's where we observe the client's response time delivered to the client. We run similar statistics for FTP, HTTP web dev, 
iSCSI, just like Fiber Channel, Operations and Bytes, and the demonstration we're going to show today is NFS Operations. So we can see initially drilling down by type, client, file name, share, project, latency, response time, size, and offset. Like NFS, we can watch SMB, similar statistics, and finally SRP for people that run iSCSI over InfiniBand with RDMA protocol, we can watch SRP just like we can watch iSCSI. Those drill downs are a beginning of what we can look at in the system. To make it easier to work with the system, we can also build these into preloaded worksheets and save those worksheets for reference later. You can see this particular test system is used by a lot of us here in the sales and engineering groups and we cover different aspects of demonstrations we give with the system. I'm going to show you a worksheet I like to use that just covers general NFS monitoring. We start up this worksheet, we can see I'm watching first and foremost NFS operations broken down by type. We like to see the read and write operations broken out separately, it gives us an idea of what the clients are doing. Watch NFS operations by client so we can see the users that are accessing the system and how much those users are accessing the system. In this particular case, the 1080-5492 represents a VMware system I'm going to show you later. And these other systems are people sharing access to the rig right now. NFS operations broken down by file name is very handy. If you want to know when users are accessing data, you can see the specific files they're accessing. And on this particular example, we see a user is scanning what looks to be a large number of files, and we can even look at that more graphically to see in a pie chart what those users are doing to the data. In this case, we can see there are roughly 10 files that are taking care of most of the workload, and those 10 files, as we're highlighting here, are accessed just about uniformly. So it's a you know a nice picture of how the, the application is running. So we move down the stack, NFS operations per second broken down by latency. This includes read and write lumped together. It's nice to have the statistic as a single statistic from an ease of use standpoint. Later we'll show how to break them out by reads and writes separately. Network interface is broken down by interface. Here we see our NGE0 link running very close to line speed. And then finally, moving down through this, the disks, we can see disks broken down by utilization, relatively idle on this screenshot. CPU at 17%, not really working. Our arc access broken down by hits and misses, so we can see the data hits and data misses broken out separately. In this particular example, we have mostly misses in the system. For those misses that are occurring, or mostly hits in the system, for the misses that are occurring, we can see in the yellow sketch here, those misses all would be served by an L2 arc. So we can invest in the L2 arc with confidence for this particular workload. And one last bit, we can watch files broken down by offset. In this particular workload, we can see they're randomly distributed. And finally, read and write operations separately broken down by latency. And last, a disk utilization 95% by disk. This tells us when our disks start to get pegged, we can light them up individually to help tell the difference between a disk that's failing mechanically versus all the disks that are getting saturated. So with this instrumentation, how would we apply it to solving a real-world problem? The first problem we look at is I have a customer, we'll imagine in this terminal window, that's going to run a workload. In this case, he's going to run a miss operation to the disk, 32K random reads, 64 pending IOs. And this particular user is going to look at the quality service that's delivered in terms of the average response time and total IO rate make a judgment about if that I.O. response time is good or bad, and then let us know how they feel about it. The way they're going to measure the output of the system is with I.O. stat. And from that I.O. stat report, we'll be able to see what the client thinks is happening from the storage system. Here we see about 1,100, 1,200 reads a second. Data transfer is about 37 megabytes per second. Service time is about 53 milliseconds and 64 pending active IOs. This particular user, I know well, has complained that this is insufficient to solve a problem. I think performance is terrible. We need to do something about a storage system. As a storage administrator, I can look very quickly at the workload real time, try to find out what's going on. This particular screenshot, we can see our 1,200 reads a second matches pretty close to the 1,200 reads a second reported by the user. As we can see, the 1080-5492 user is the one that's accessing the system. And as before, we can see that workload that I had shown you 
This is this particular set of test files that are getting looked at. Those particular test files, the quality of service, looking at the system, we can see most of the IOs are coming in under 70 milliseconds with most of them happening in the range of 70 to 38 milliseconds. The reported average response time of just over 50 milliseconds is shown in the, the screenshot is consistent with what we have measured on the storage system. So, so far we agree with our customer what the performance of the rig is. Now we need to go look through and find out what the problem is with the rig performance. Looking at the physical back end of the system, we can see there's almost 50 active IOs. The HI rig group that backs up the system, you know, with 50 IOs pending is about six IOs per drive. Six IOs per drive is enough to keep the drives pretty busy. Just broken down by percent utilization, we can see is nearly 100%. In this particular system, the bottleneck is clearly the physical disk drives. So our user has completely overrun the capacity of the physical disk drives in the system. From a headroom perspective, CPU kernel space is about 8%. We have plenty of CPU left in the system. And if we look at the way the cache is being used, we can see nearly all of the IOs coming across as misses. Very few of the IOs hits as cache hostile workload. Those misses well served would be well served by an L2 arc. We can see that almost all of the misses would be accessed from the L2 arc if an L2 arc was installed, which means if we install an L2 arc, we could alleviate the particular quality of service problem by increasing the throughput for those random IO operations. Size perspective, good double check with the application. We see most of the IOs are coming in right about 32K, like our user says. And the physical access of the data file, we picked one data file 8 to look at by offset. We can see relatively uniform access throughout the entire data file. Last read operations broken down by latency gives us a little more detailed pitch. Again, we see the same roughly 40 to 70 milliseconds consistent with the reported 50 millisecond average and writes, not very many of them going on. Last, disk operations, greater than 95% broken down by disk. This is a handy statistic that tells you which particular devices are being used to support the workload and which ones are pegged. An interesting way to break this down, we can see the drive tray, AK001, and there's eight disk drives that are completely maxed out. So this is all consistent with the RAID groups not big enough to support the client workload. Last, from an ARC size, we can see there's about 8 gigabytes worth of capacity in the ARC. This is a very small system. That's the limit. The ARC's not warming up. We know this isn't a warm-up problem. So we can confidently say that if the user's workload fit in cache, either the L2 ARC or the ARC, we would increase the quality of service. Likewise, if we increase the number of disk drives in the system, we could also increase the quality of service or the throughput delivered. As an illustration of the test, we're going to go through and rather than change the size of the rig, we're going to change the size of the data that we operate on. This next bit, instead of scanning over hundreds of gig with an 8 gig cache, we're going to scan over just a few gig for that 8 gig cache. Effectively, what we've done is we've increased the cache size with respect to the workload, and we can figure out if the client's going to be happy, and if the client's not happy, how to solve the next bottleneck. As we used before, we run IOSTAT to keep a sharp eye on the system. We can see with this particular miss workload, we've got 111 megabytes a second, 30, almost 3,600 IOs per second, 63 active IO just like we had before, and a 17 millisecond service time, 17 or 18. The client is, you know, that's better than 60, but we've still got some question of we want it faster, and the client's complaining again the storage system is a problem, we need to alleviate the problem, you need more cache, you need more disk drives. Rather than just react to the system, we can again look quantitatively to find out where the problem is, and then very accurately sort out what's going on. Like we did before, we can match up the NFS operations from the client, seeing the same 35,300 matches well with what the client's reporting, 35,300. We know that the .92 client, again, is the same one accessing the system. So there's no conflict of workload in this case. Same data files are being accessed, which again shows us the workload's the same. Going down to NFS operations, we see our first hint as to the effectiveness of changing the cache. See here of the you know, 35, 3800 operations per second going on, 
nearly 3,500 of them are coming in under 100 microseconds. This is the cache response time of the system. The maximum response time we see observed for this workload is only 4 milliseconds. Therefore, the reported client-side response time of 50 millisec or 17 milliseconds is well in excess of the response time from the NFS server on the target. That means the bottleneck in the system is somewhere upstream from the NFS server and the ZFS storage appliance, downstream from the application. This puts us in the network layer as well as the, the network link layers, so network drivers and network links. Moving down, network interface bytes broken down by interface. We see 120 megabytes per second on NGE0, our 1 gigabit Ethernet link. That is very close to the maximum possible data we can push through that 1 gigabit Ethernet link. Once again, we see clearly the bottleneck in the system is lit up by a completely saturated hardware resource. So double check on the rest of the rig, disk I.O. operations broken down by state. Before, when we had 50 active IOs to the disk, now we only have one, so the disk drives are clearly not the bottleneck in the system. Adding disk drives would not help to support the workload. CPU, like before, CPU consumption is up, which we expect with more throughput in the system. We have plenty of headroom at 16% consumption. Arc access, broken down by hit and miss, we can see the efficacy of changing the size of the data set with respect to the size of the cache. Instead of mostly misses, we have nearly all hits in the system. We can't even observe the misses. And with very few misses, there's very little eligible for the L2 arc. NFS operations broken by size. Again, we can see client is running about 32K, just like they said. By offset, we can see it's the same workload, roughly uniformly spread. However, now it's 10 megabytes per file instead of several gigabytes per file. And last, the reads broken out by latency or response time first. You can see the reads are handled individually at 3400, writes non-existent. Going back to the disks, the hierarchy that we had here needs to be refreshed show that there's no disk that has a utilization greater than 95%. The disks, like we said, are idle. And finally, the arc size is the same as we were before. So with that, we've shown you a little bit about how you can compare the application response time, the storage system response time, as well as the component consumptions to pin down the bottlenecks in the system quickly and accurately, and then take proactive steps to alleviate those bottlenecks by adding the right kind of hardware. Hope you found that interesting. We'll look forward to giving you more talks on how to use analytics in the future. Thank you.